uh, I'm Holly Svandiari, the director of the Middle East uh, program. Would like, I would like to welcome you to today's meeting um, from 1910 to 2010, understanding the causes and consequences of youth and other grievances that drive the Second Arab Revolt. We couldn't have had a better person than Rami Khouri as our uh, speaker. Um, Rami is a former public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center. He is the director of the Assam Forest Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at AUB and he's a visiting scholar at the Forest Center at Tufts University. Um, we all know Rami as the well-known, famous journalist uh, who is very provocative in his uh, writings. Uh, Rami often comments on Middle East issues in the international uh, media, including the BBC and the National Public Radio, and he lectures frequently at conferences and universities throughout uh, the world. He's a member of the Leadership Council of the Harvard Divinity School, a board member of the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University, and the member of the International Advisory Council of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, in 2002, he was named a member of the Brookings Institution Task Force on U.S. Relations with the Islamic World. Um, and he also served for many years as the chief umpire for the Little League Baseball in Jordan. And the reason why he comes always this time of the year is to America is that he wants to go to Syracuse to watch the, base, uh, the basketball game. Rami, you have the floor. Thank you, Hale. Um, thank you all for coming and uh, for inviting me. Um, I also like to come here at this time of year to trash talk the Georgetown fans. So if there's any Georgetown fans, I'm a Syracuse fan, so that's, uh, that explains it. But, uh, uh, but I'm here to uh, talk about politics and Middle East developments as well. And, and this, I thought I was going to have a quiet month in February at uh, the Ferris Center at Tufts University watching college basketball, watching the snow, and turns out it's not so quiet because it's a very busy time in the region, uh, but it's a very exciting time. And I'm happy to have this opportunity to share some ideas with you um, um, and some analysis about what I believe is actually happening uh, throughout the Arab world. Um, it's a very dynamic uh, process. There's uh, all kinds of things changing every day, but I believe that there's a, a, a lot of uh, uh, food for thought and a lot of substance that we can actually analyze pretty uh, clearly if um, all of us in the United States as well as in the Middle East um, come to analyzing the Arab world with more clarity uh, less ideological uh, frenzy and extremism and zealotry than has been the case before, uh, and with more honesty and more consistency. Uh, I think this is an opportunity for everybody to, to, to look again at what's going on in the Arab world, leave uh, aside the ideological baggage and the, um, and the um, uh, political uh, sentiments that have dri driven so much um, of the American and European analysis of the Arab world and to really look at it with uh, fresh eyes. I think this is an important opportunity uh, to do that. But uh, uh, Halle said I, I'm sometimes provocative. That's probably my Arab side, but I try to also be accurate, which is what I learned in American journalism. Uh, and uh, so I will try to give you a provocative but I hope uh, accurate analysis of, of what is actually going on and, and maybe the best way to do that 
is to just go back to the basic uh, journalism that I learned and, and practiced for so many years and to, to ask, well, you know, what the who, what, where, when, and why of what's going on? What is this story? What is going on? What are the different dimensions of it? Uh, and what are the consequences? Uh, and, and, and how should we then uh, deal with it? What are the lessons that we can learn if we identify the who, what, where, when, and why of, of actually what's going on? So I'll start by saying, well, what's going on? Uh, I, I believe that what is going on is nothing uh, less than the second Arab revolt, the first Arab revolt around 1900, 1910, when the Arabs first uh, agitated, many Arabs agitated for their independence from Ottoman rule. Um, and uh, 100 years later, I think we are now into the second Arab revolt. Um, this is a... Uh, this is the biggest event, I believe, in the Arab world uh, since um, the founding of the modern Arab border in 1920, 1930, 1940, in that region, uh, uh, since the Arab countries were founded. And since they went through several major developments, the Arab-Israeli uh, war of 47, 48, the creation of Israel, the, the, the disenfranchisement and exile of, and the refugeehood of the Palestinians, uh, the developmental boom, the state building experience of the Arabs, the um, advent of the modern Arab security and police states in the 1970s, um, and all of the different things that have happened over the last hundred years. I believe this is the the most uh, significant because I believe that it is nothing less than uh, the first, and I, if it continues and, and flourishes, which I believe it will, I believe this is nothing less than the first uh, credible example of Arabs becoming self-determinant. Arab citizens defining their national ideology, their system of governance, their values, their relations with each other, their relations with people in, uh, around the region, Arabs and uh, and non-Arabs, uh, uh, providing a mechanism of governance that can be democratic, pluralistic, and accountable, and at the same time reflect genuine indigenous values and historical legacies and social traditions. Um, I think this is the uh, process that is being now uh, is unleashed and is unfolding and will take some some years to play itself out, uh, but it is going to lead at its best to something that we've also never really had, which is uh, genuine sovereignty in the Arab world. Sovereignty meaning uh, policy making and governance based on the consent of the governed. We've had independent Arab states, but we haven't really had sovereign Arab states who really decide their own policies, their own values, based completely on the will of the people because the Arab political and governance system has been dominated and defined uh, f for most of the last century by either families who were put in place by retreating European colonial powers or by self-imposed military rulers who took over in the Arab countries, who took over through revolutions and then installed police and security state systems that defined the Arab world for the last half a century. We've never had a self-determinant, truly sovereign Arab political mm -hmm. structure in all these different Arab countries where the consent of the governed was the driving force of public policy making, national values, and national decision making. It's just, it's never happened on a major scale. And I believe this is one of the possible outcomes. And we're seeing possibly uh, the uh, emergence of a historic uh, process uh, which is the emergence uh, for the first time ever in the modern Arab world of the concept of citizen citizenship in the Arab world, of what it means to be a citizen of a country with rights that are defined by law, defined by the laws that the citizens themselves create, and guaranteed by a mechanism of governance that is accountable to the will of the majority while protecting the minority rights. I believe these are unbelievably historic elements, uh, and if, uh, if they all play themselves out, uh, we may have a, a, a quite a glorious uh, future ahead with many of these positive things. 
We have no idea if this will happen or not, but I believe that the, a, a force has been unleashed, uh, which is unprecedented in all of these dimensions, and it is now up to the Arab people themselves, with their institutions that exist, and with partners around the world who want to be engaged in an honest manner, uh, it's up to us now to define this process. So this is what I believe is, uh, is happening. The second Arab revolt, uh, I think, is underway, and it, it, it will play itself out over some years. And we see it literally every day, uh, Bahrain, uh, Libya, Yemen, uh, uh, others to follow. Uh, so that's the what. Uh, who? Who is doing this? I think one of the significant things is that this is a youth-driven process, but it is a youth-driven process which reflects sentiments that are common to all of Arab societies. And we, we know this now better than ever before, largely thanks to polling evidence that has been done by the Gallup organization, an American group uh, that has now opened an office in Abu Dhabi and has been polling the Arab world, and especially Arab youth, 15 to 29-year-olds, for, for many years, but for the last two years, Every six months, Gallup has done a poll of young people in 22 Arab countries. It's an amazing body of knowledge and data that is uh, extremely, uh, uh, I think, uh, re relevant, uh, accurate, credible, um, and provides uh, tremendous insights into the thinking of young people, uh, which I'll get into in a minute. But the m equally important thing from this data, because they poll the entire population in 22 Arab countries, but they take the 15 to 29 year olds and then they take the 30 years old and above. And the, the important thing is that in virtually every single indicator, except for one, which is the desire to migrate, which young people want to migrate much more, mainly because they have to find jobs. So, but, so young people want to migrate at a much higher rate than older people, than adults. But in almost every single indicator, the sentiments of youth and the sentiments of adults are virtually identical. So we should not allow ourselves to be uh, lulled into, fooled into thinking that this is a, a bunch of uh, young people and these are hormones at work and, and you have to watch out for these young people because they're radical, but really the rest of the Arabs uh, don't want to all do this necessarily. The reality is that the young people in the Arab world and elsewhere are, I believe, the best barometer, the most accurate barometer of public sentiments on a much wider, uh, on a much wider uh, scale. And so it's critically important, more than ever, to explore the issues that young people raise, the grievances that they articulate, the desires that they uh, speak about, and the sense of their rights. The sense of their rights, what do they feel are their rights as citizens of countries, as uh, human beings, um, uh, and people who feel that their rights have not been uh, satisfied. It's, this is the time more than ever to probe deep into what young people are saying. And we have that information now. We didn't have it 15, 20, 30 years ago. Many people in the region have been writing about youth and talking to them, and, and, and there's been many opportunities to understand the Arabs better, but the, 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 these opportunities were ignored by many people in the Arab world their regimes, particularly the ruling elites, as well as people in the Western world and, uh, and other places. So uh, this is now a moment to really understand what young people are saying because it gives us an entry point into the sentiments of the majority of people. The third question is why. Uh, why, is, why did this happen? And I'll get into the youth a bit more in a second, but I want to go, go through the who, what, when, where, and why. Why is this going on? I believe that um, what has been unleashed uh, reflects a combination uh, of a convergence of material pressures and grievances and intangible complaints and grievances that have come together combined with the element of time. That is, for decades and decades and decades, I would say at least two generations from the 1960s until now, we've had sustained autocratic government, sometimes leading to authoritarian and police state and security state brut brut brutality uh, and at the level of governance, total lack of democratic opportunities, corruption, police uh, brutality, abuse of power, 
favoritism, lack of opportunities in an equitable manner, a whole range of these intangible issues combined with economic and social and environmental stresses, uh, inability to get enough jobs. If you get a job, you don't get enough money to get married, you, you don't get enough money to rent a house. Um, uh, water uh, problems, people are leaving their homes in parts of the Arab world. In Syria, there's four or 500,000 environmental refugees who've left the Northeast and moved into the cities simply because there's not enough water. In rural Jordan, you have similar problems. In Yemen, this is a massive problem all over Yemen. So environmental, social, economic, and political stresses, all of which are indigenous uh, in their manifestations and in their origins, combined with the two other great sources of anxiety and, and, and stress, which is the, the consequences of the Arab-Israeli conflict, the continued humiliation of inability to either make war or peace with Israel to deal with the, the challenge of Zionism that Arabism has been unable to deal with, uh, and the continued humiliation of Israeli colonization and, and Zionist uh, uh, colonization and occupation, which continues to go on, defying the entire world, that combined with the continued movement of foreign armies into our region. Since Napoleon until today, 200 and some years of nonstop Western foreign armies coming in to the region, uh, telling us what to do, reordering our wor world, reconfiguring it, reconfiguring it in the manner that they believe is best for us uh, and for them. That combination of indigenous problems, regional stresses and humiliations, and international degradation has combined over two generations now to create not just a sense of um, anger, uh, irritation, uh, but has moved over to degradation and finally to a sense of dehumanization. And you have, I believe, a mass problem of dehumanization that human beings in the Arab world feeling that they're less than human because they're treated by their own societies, by the Israelis, by the Western armies as less than human beings, as less than citizens and less than human beings. And finally, this has led to a situation where people have, uh, have uh, erupted on a, a big scale. It's very important to keep in mind that this is not the first time that people have expressed these grievances. I'll mention that a little later, that we've had many examples of this, many signs of this, but people in the Arab world, in Israel, in Europe, in the United States, refuse to see the signs, refuse to deal honestly, accurately, with the many, many expressions of discontent and resentment and anger and desperation that people were expressing all over the Arab world in so many different forms. Uh, so this is, again, another time to look at the Arab world more honestly, more uh, accurately. Uh, when, uh, when, who, what, where, when, and why, when did this happen? Why did it um, happen at this particular moment? Well, the culmination of that process of degradation and dehumanization that I've explained, I think, um, in a way that we can never predict, um, you can never predict a Rosa Parks. You can never predict why would somebody refuse to go to the back of the bus. Why did Rosa Parks on that day refuse to go to the back of the bus? Why did uh, Muhammad uh, Bouazizi uh, set himself on fire? Uh, you can't predict these things. You, you can't predict when they're going to happen, but you absolutely would know they're going to happen. You know that people who are dehumanized by their own societies will not acquiesce in the perpetual dehumanization of th themselves and their families, that they will fight back, they will resist, they will demand to be rehumanized. Um, w we don't know when it'll happen, but we know it will happen, and, and, and many people in the Arab world have been uh, saying this. Um, and, and this is why it's important to understand now that uh, it's that combination, I believe, of the material stresses can't get a job, not uh, able to feed your family, you try to go out and sell fruits and vegetables on a cart to feed your brothers and sisters, and, and a, police, a police officer comes and beats you on the head, takes the cart away. That combination of material and non-material intangible 
degradation and hopelessness creates a humiliation and a dehumanization that erupts at one point. And, and this is not happening in a vacuum. We've had, if you just take Egypt, uh, if you take the Arab world as a whole, but if you just take Egypt, you go back over the last 30, 40 years, so many movements, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, militant Islamist groups, uh, uh, violent Islamist groups, uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood who are nonviolent, um, human rights activists, democracy activists, um, uh, lawyers and judges, uh, student groups, labor unions, uh, there's media people, uh, academics. There are dozens and dozens of examples going back over the last 30 years in the Arab world in Syria, in Jordan, in Egypt, in Morocco, in every Arab country, in Saudi Arabia, in every Arab country, we've had signs of these kinds of uh, uh, natural uh, uh, attempts by indigenous people in these societies to say that they refuse to acquiesce in their own dehumanization and, and the lack of their political and citizenship rights. But every time a movement started to try to make some progress in any Arab country, it was decisively put down by the modern Arab security state with the direct, sustained, and significant assistance of major Western governments, including the United States. And this has gone on for decade after decade after decade. And when people were talking about this throughout the Arab world in the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, uh, it fell on deaf ears. People were not interested in hearing about this. The political order in the Arab world did not want to deal with it. The political order in the Western world did not particularly uh, want to deal with it, other than just occasional rhetorical uh, flourishes. Uh, so this it happened now simply because the, the accumulation of pain and degradation became too much. And all you needed was one event to spark an entire uh, fire. Um, and this was... Uh, like Rosa Parks, uh, like uh, Steve Biko, uh, like um, Solidarity in Poland that 10 years later brought down the entire Soviet empire, you needed one person, one event uh, uh, to do this. And we knew that once this started in the Arab world, it would spread. The Arab world was the only, after the end of the Cold War, was the only collectively and uh, um, continuously structurally non-democratic part of the world. The democratic waves that hit so many other parts of the world, East Asia, Africa, South America, Soviet Empire, every other part of the world experienced significant democratization and sometimes total democratization except the Arab world. There wasn't a single Arab democracy. And it's the Arab world. It's not the Muslim world. It's the Arab world. There was something about the Arab political order whether it's oil, whether it's Arab-Israeli conflict, whether it's uh, the nature of statehood, whether it's strategic geography, take your pick, maybe all of the above. There was something about the Arab world that maintained a chronically non-democratic, autocratic uh, system that was immune to both internal challenges and any light external uh, prodding. But finally, uh, um, Muhammad Bouazizi lit the spark, uh, literally lit, he was the spark, he, he set himself on fire and this, uh, this was the moment that nobody could predict in a rural village in Algeria that set, in a rural town in Algeria that uh, set this process uh, uh, in motion. Um, and, and where? Where is this happening finally? Who, what, where, when and why? It's happening all over the Arab world I believe uh, for several reasons. The first is the nature of the grievances that common people express are very, very similar across almost the entire Arab world, with the exception of the small, wealthy, oil and gas rich Gulf uh, states and sheikhdoms. Uh, and even there, you have in Bahrain, in parts of Saudi Arabia, you have elements of poverty and, and deprivation and, and political. Uh, subjugation, but uh, most of the oil-rich states don't have these pressures because they have small populations, a lot of money, material needs are well met, and there isn't a significant demand for political uh, change. There are some calls here and there, but nothing significant. So uh, you take away that 15% of the Arab world that 
is reflected in these wealthy Gulf societies or the very wealthy people in the rest of the Arab world who are now mostly living in, in London and Paris and out and leaving the Arab world. Uh, but, but you take away the 15 percent, most of the Arab world uh, suffers the same combination of a social and economic stress and political autocracy with no means of not only changing the situation, no means of even expressing your desire to change it other than on offshore satellite television like uh, Jazeera or writing articles in the Western press, but uh, there's no significant means within the countries to even articulate the need to change. Um, so it's happening, I believe, because all over the region, because the nature of the stresses and the grievances are very similar and the nature of the political control mechanisms and the governance systems are very similar. Each country is different in the Arab world, but, but lack of democracy is a consistent uh, problem across the entire region. Some countries are more authoritarian than others. Some are gentler autocracies. Some are harsher autocracies. There's a, there's a big range. You have monarchies. You have republics. You have all kinds of things in between. But in no Arab country do you have a credible political governance system that is based on the consent of the governed, the rule of the majority of the citizenry and the protection of minority rights, not a single one. Uh, and, and this is why I believe this is going to be um, happening, as, as we can see already, uh, all over the region. And you'll have different responses by the citizens, you'll have different demands, you'll have different responses by the ruling authorities. And you can see it already in the last two or three weeks. You've seen Arab rulers and leaders raising salaries, lowering prices, uh, changing governments, creating new dialogue opportunities, most of which are too late. Uh, you, you, can't, you can't react with any credibility to these kinds of pressures um, when uh, large numbers of your people are demanding their citizenship rights. Uh, and free and democratic and accountable uh, mechanisms, uh, you can't suddenly at the end come and say, oh, okay, I'm going to raise your salary. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, so that's the who, what, where, when, and why. And I think uh, what we're um, uh, seeing now is the unleashing of a process that will take many years to play itself out. Let me make a couple of quick comments uh, to close about the consequences and some of the issues that we should, uh, should keep in mind. Um, uh, Self-determination is a long process. Uh, state building is a long process. It took the Europeans 500 years to get from the Magna Carta to the French Revolution. It took the United States 300 years to get from a democracy which was run by slave and land-owning old white men to a situation in the 1950s and 60s where every American men and women, black and white, every American on paper had equal rights. It took 300 years for that process to materialize, including a civil war and massive genocidal uh, um, um, uh, losses uh, by Native Americans and, and massive sustained dehumanization for African Americans and all kinds of terrible things in between. But ultimately, the American democratic system, because its own people demanded that they no longer be dehumanized, that they enjoy their citizenship rights, that they ultimately uh, were able to rely on the rule of law to change the racist laws and the other laws and to create a system that was in fact more responsive and gives people equal rights, uh, which are in fact enjoyed by most people, uh, I think, in the United States. The process takes time. It won't happen uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, this is the beginning of a process of, uh, of, of state building, I believe, in the Arab world. The, 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 process underway is not just getting rid of Hosni Mubarak or Zain al-Abidin bin Ali or Ali Abdullah Saleh or all of these other characters who've been there for 30 or 40 years in some cases. The process underway is a total reconfiguration of the exercise of power. It is a complete reconfiguration of the institutions of governance and statehood and how public authority is exercised, how citizen rights are defined, and how those two things uh, interact with, with one another. Some countries were able to do this more quickly in the transition in uh, Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet Empire, the transition in Korea and Taiwan and Chile and other places in South Africa. Once the decision is made to do this, this, the transition can happen within two, three, four, five years, and then it takes a long time to then address the underlying inequities and disparities in income and, and things of that, uh, of that nature. The, um, the 
the development of a truly self-determinant, uh, free, democratic, pluralistic, accountable, and sovereign Arab state system is going to have to reflect the four critical values that are the four dominant values in the region. Arabism, Islamism, tribalism, and cosmopolitanism, especially in the great Arab cities around the Mediterranean, but also f further inland. Arabism, Islamism, tribalism, and cosmopolitanism are the four defining values of, the, of our cultures across the Arab world. They will have to be factored into the democratic process as it emerges. And you have the, the, the newest uh, f factor, uh, which is the modern Arab state, the Euro-manufactured modern Arab state, which has not come into the 21st century in very good shape and now is being reconfigured by its own people. But state identities, to be a Jordanian, to be a Syrian, to be a Tunisian, will be factored into the, these issues uh, of Arabism, Islamism, tribalism, and cosmopolitanism. The second point I'd say is that we, we need to, I think, be very clear that what we're seeing now is not an ideological revolt, it's a biological revolt. People are not talking about tax policy, education policy, they're not talking about Israel, about Europe, about Russia, about the US, they're talking about their humanity. This is, the, this is a revolt of biology, of the will, the desire to, to be able to manifest all your human faculties, to read, to speak, to hear, to debate, to dance, to go to a theater, to engage in cultural activity, to dress as you want, to travel as you want, to, to be able to manifest the human faculties that were given to you by God, not by your ruler. The human desire to live as a human being is the driving force of this process right now at this stage. Ending dehumanization means a process of rehumanization. It's a biological process. The ideology will follow. Tax policy, education policy, farming, secular religious balance, relation, do you make war or peace with Israel? Do you like or fear Iran? Is America your friend or your enemy? These will be coming out of a process by which the consent of the governed actually kicks in and sovereign self-determinant Arab countries can make these decisions uh, in a manner that reflects the, the free will uh, of, their, of their people. Third point I'd make is that the demands, the, the issues that are raised by the youth revolt now are almost identical to the issues that have been raised by the Islamist movements in the last 30 or 40 years. And the Islamist movements were the strongest movements uh, in the region because they were the only ones that the governments couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, ban. Uh, Islamist uh, demands were couched in vague terms generally of justice, equity, dignity, citizenship, ending corruption, law-based governance, broad demands, and they're almost identical to what the young people are saying now, and they're identical to what the pioneering political activists in the Arab world in the 60s and 70s and 80s, who the human rights activists and the democracy activists who challenged their governments were saying uh, the similar thing. So I think the key to this is to go beneath the surface and say, well, what are these common demands that have been articulated for the last 40 years by secular politicians that failed, by Islamist movements that failed, and now by young people driving a movement that seems to be making some headway. And to focus on the rights that are being demanded and not the personalities that are making the demands. The biggest mistake to make now, and it's already happening in some of the public discussion in the United States, whether by officials or, or, or some, of the, uh, some of the nonsensical stuff you see in some of the nonsensical media in this country, some of it, not all of it. You have some very good media in this country, but you have some real nonsense. And they're already starting to try to divert the discussion about, well, what if the Muslim Brothers come in? What about Iran? What does this do to Israel? What does this do to uh, American foreign policy? Uh, 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 diverting attention to start focusing on these issues rather than looking at the rights of the people that are being articulated for the second and a half generation in a row would be one of the great uh, mistakes uh, that people could make. So I think it's important uh, not to focus on individuals or movements, but to focus on the issues that they're uh, expressing. And that raises the um, next point, which is that the, um, 
um, the really important thing for people in the Arab world right now is for them to be seen as people in their own right who have rights, not to be seen as adjuncts of Israel or adjuncts of Iran or adjuncts of Turkey or adjuncts of the Pentagon or the war on terror or anything else, to see the Arab people as people who have rights in their own right as you see the people of Bosnia, as you see the people of the Central African Republic, as you see the people of Myanmar. Not to judge them in relation to somebody else, but to judge them in relation to themselves only. And this is one of the critical issues that is going to be defined, I believe, in the next um, literally probably weeks. If the public debate in the, in the US and Europe outside the Arab world is going to hijack this process, and not to look at the Arabs as people with the rights, but to look at them as adjuncts to other people's security uh, or, or energy or other concerns. Uh, I think the, uh, the peaceful revolt that we're seeing now will turn into a much, much more uh, serious and probably much more violent process. Because if, if people refuse around the world, in Israel, in Europe, in the US, in Russia, and wherever, if people refuse to, to engage with the Arab people, on the basis that they are human beings and citizens with rights, uh, then they are, then what your what the message to the Arabs will be that that you you are not allowed to escape your dehumanization that you have to remain dehumanized, and what we've the message we've had from the Arab world uh, is that the era of dehumanization is over, the era of colonialism is over, the era of foreign and domestic subjugation is over. We want to define our own societies. And this is a critical transitional moment now uh, when these things have to be recognized. Just a, a last point about the youth. I mentioned uh, the youth, and um, I, I want to just four or five minutes to keep within the time frame. Um, the, the, the data we have about young people, why did these young people suddenly uh, emerge? I gave you this combination of material and intangible objects, but let me give you just a couple of statistics from the from the uh, uh, research, the polling data by Gallup, which is all available on, the, if you go to the gallup.com, or gallup, yeah, gallup.com, I think, um, they've done an amazing amount of research, which is on their website, and they've done work for uh, the Silitec group in Doha, in Qatar, which is a Qatari group working on youth transitions from education to employment across the Arab world. Uh, and they've done these youth surveys, or youth polls, which, which are giving us unbelievably interesting uh, insights. Uh, and what they show is two things. They show the, uh, well, three things. The first thing they show is there's a lot of variety across the re region. Some countries are better than others, and anxieties are greater in some places than other places. So th they show that the Arab world is, there is no Arab world, that there are 22 different Arab countries with many different conditions, but there are common grievances, as I mentioned, uh, and common uh, governance uh, uh, problems. Uh, but then uh, they also show two other important things, that there is a, a significant process of erosion of legitimacy from within the Arab system. And this is one of the cre key critical issues that this data helps to, uh, helps to reveal. And if you're interested, by the way, in this uh, next Tuesday, the 22nd, there's an event at Tufts University that I will be speaking with um, Muhammad Yunus from the Gallup, who has been one of the people running this uh, project in the Middle East. He's coming over for this, and we're going to put an event at Tufts University. It'll be on the web. Uh, I don't know if it'll be live, but it'll, if you're interested, you'll be able to catch it on the web. And, and our, in my institute, the Isan Fadis Institute at AUB, has just finished with UNICEF Regional Office the first report, Study of Arab Youth. We've worked on it for two years with massive qualitative analysis from about 50, 60 scholars around the Arab world. And now we have this incredible quantitative data from Gallup. So the two together give us tremendous important insights into young people. But a couple of just quick points uh, that this data shows that there's these tremendous grievances. Uh, for instance, you have across the Arab world, uh, and if you take away the rich 15%, like I said, the Kuwaits and the Qatars and the UAEs, where you don't have these pressures, if you take the vast majority uh, of Arabs, the medium and low income countries, you find that the desire to immigrate uh, is around 35%, uh, about one third of young people. And these are the most educated, the most productive, the people in society, they want to leave and they want to go away for good. They don't want to stay in these countries. And they want to leave for 
economic reasons, but also for political reasons. And this was particularly true in Tunisia. If you look at the Tunisia chapter of the latest report, and you can go to the Silatech.org website, or um, Silatech is S-I-L-A-T-E-C-H, Silatech.org, or the Gallup, you'll have this Arab youth report, that, or Arab youth survey that they've done, uh, and they give you country by country breakdown. It's very, very powerful data, but it shows you that uh, in some countries the desire to immigrate goes up to 40, in Morocco it's 43 percent, in Tunisia it was 46 percent. I mean, it's not an accident that Tunisia was the place where this uh, started. And in Tunisia, the people who, the young people, 46 percent, almost half of the young people, want to leave forever, get out of their country. And they're reasonably well, edu reasonably well educated, and the Tunisian economy is supposed to be doing well, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, they want to leave because of the political governance complaints and because of the economic uh, stress. Uh, 32 percent on average of young people, about a third of all of the young people in the Arab world, uh, cannot find affordable housing. They simply cannot, uh, don't have housing available to them that they can afford, that's decent to live in, and therefore they can't get married, and that postpones marriage, and, um, and they stay with their parents, and all kinds of uh, uh, tensions happen. About 50% only of young people have confidence in the judicial systems. Half of the young people have no confidence in their judicial systems. About 53% only have confidence in the government, and almost half of them have no confidence in the government. Um, only about 30 Six, thirty-five, thirty-six percent of people in medium and low-income uh, youth, youth in medium and low-income countries, only about a third feel that elections are honest. Two-thirds feel that elections are not credible. They don't bother taking part in them. They don't get involved in political life. They've just left the political uh, system. But, and there's many other things. I don't have time to go into them. But with these negative things and these pressures and problems that people have, and lack of confidence, lack of a uh, sense of opportunity uh, and hope, you also have powerful supportive factors in people's lives. Uh, something like 80%, uh, 85% of young people across the region feel that they have somebody they can count on to help them in need, in times of need. Uh, family, friends, uh, neighbors, whatever. About the same uh, number um, uh, f feels that uh, they have uh, about 85 percent in across the region, 86 percent feel they have confidence in their religious organizations. So there, there's not much confidence in the government and the judici judiciary. The media, by the way, is about 40 percent confidence only, very low confidence. But they have confidence in the religious organizations, mostly Muslim uh, organizations. So you have these strong forces of support as well as the strong forces of disequilibrium and, and grievance uh, working to, uh, together. And that's why I believe for so many years the region uh, has not exploded uh, in one big explosion. You've had these little signs and eruptions, but it, people endured the indignities for so many years because there were these other factors in their lives. And for most of the period from the 30s to the 80s or early 90s, People's lives generally were improving. They were getting telephones, hospitals, schools, jobs, until the last two, two to three decades since the mid-'80s is when things started to, uh, uh, to go bad. Uh, so I think these are the main points that, uh, that I would make because I don't want to exceed my time and we'll have more time for uh, questions and discussions. Uh, this is a new uh, start for everybody, for the Arabs for the Israelis, for the Western powers. Everybody should look at this as a new opportunity, a fresh beginning, and not to make the same mistakes that people uh, have made in the past. And, 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 and most of all, uh, to be honest, uh, to be accurate in one's analysis, and to address issues as they really are, and not as you would like them to be or somebody else wants you to. Uh, like them to be. Uh, don't uh, l allow your analysis, your politics, your judgment to be clouded either by historical uh, fears, uh, political lobby groups, uh, energy interests, uh, Christian, uh, Muslim, Jewish, uh, any other religious uh, lobby groups. Uh, ignore all of these things because th all of these things in the past have led us to this uh, uh, situation. I think this is the time to start again uh, and most importantly, to be honest uh, and, and to be consistent. Thank you very much.
and Ram is going to be wired and then we'll take uh, questions uh, from the uh, floor. Just, just one. Rami, let me ask you. I've been uh, wired since I was in college here. In <laughs> <laughs> You'll be wired, that's it. Um, Rami, how can a movement with no leadership then eventually succeed? What we hear now is that there are really, there is not one leader in Egypt, there is not one leader in Tunisia. I mean, history, I mean, if you look at the Iranian revolution, you had Ayatollah Khomeini, really, then. You look at the Green Movement, basically the Green Movement did not have a leader in 2009. There was Karubi and Musavi, but they were not part of the younger generation, you know, both in their 70s and so So uh, can you talk about this? Because the people who came out in the streets are all young people, so. Well, I, there isn't a, a clear, organized, public uh, movement uh, leadership, uh, but there will be. And there, but I don't think this is a movement that needs initial, this is a spontaneous eruption. Uh, and it is expressing genuine, real f sentiments. And the leadership is happening now. They're coming together. And I don't think that's a big problem. In fact, the fact that it's leaderless is probably a good thing because it's, it's, it's genuine, it's spontaneous, it's natural, it's an honest uh, expression of what people want. You need leadership now because the negotiation process with the army, with uh, uh, religious groups, uh, civil groups, civil rights groups, old style political parties, the business sector, there's now an incredible bizarre negotiation, bizarre meaning in the, in the marketplace, not bizarre as in strange, but the, the bizarre, uh, the souk uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, negotiation, which will gener generate these new forms that we're looking at. And the leadership, I think, is already emerging. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't give it much uh, uh, attention or worry. Yes, please. Uh, just uh, Ambassador Katu, wait for the uh, mic. Thank you. Yeah, well, first, thank you for uh, a really insightful and uh, brilliant exposition of what we've been witnessing. Uh, as you indicate, this is all about what's been going on in the whole region and in these countries, specific countries. Uh, but a number of pundits are saying, you know, well, how's this going to affect the U.S.? How's this going to affect Israel, the treaty with Egypt and the like? I have a I sort of have a different variation of that, that you're well positioned to answer. How is this going to affect the Palestinian struggle? They've just witnessed nonviolence or largely nonviolent uprisings work in Egypt and Tunisia. I think the pollster Khalil Shikaki, and I confess I didn't read the article, I just looked at the headline, is saying that Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, is at a boil. Uh, I may be wrong somewhat on that, but that it's certainly it's a tinderbox. And uh, I'm just wondering, can you imagine uh, the Palestinians have started to adopt nonviolent tactics in the villages near the wall, Baleen and others. Could you imagine such a thing occurring for ha perhaps in Jerusalem as what we had witnessed in Egypt and Tunisia? It's possible, but I think unlikely in the short run. It could happen. You've had, I mean, the, the Palestinians see the Israelis as a colonial occupation. I know the Israelis and American mainstream society doesn't see it like that, but the Palestinians and the Arabs see Israel as a colonial uh, occupation of the Palestinians. And anti-colonial struggles generally are, 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 are not nonviolent. They generally need a militant kind of uh, response. And it's possible the Gandhi uh, experience, and there's others, the, you had examples uh, where nonviolence works. So I wouldn't rule it out, uh, but I think the nature of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and the relationship, the unbalanced relationship between them now, I think it's very difficult uh, for that to happen, but not, not impossible. I think more likely is that the democratization of the Arab world, if it happens, which I believe it will, um, will inject a massive uh, new support mechanism to the Palestinians, because a democratic Arab world will express those sentiments that people around the Arab world feel for the Palestinians. The Arabs don't want to fight perpetual wars with the Israelis. 
uh, but neither do they want to become the jailers of Gaza as Egypt felt it had, Egyptians felt Egypt had become uh, lay, laying siege to Gaza on behalf of Israel. Uh, so the, the, the Arab democratic transition will create new support for the Palestinians and hopefully will create a more rational mechanism whereby Arabs and Israelis, the Palestinians and Israelis in the first instance, can negotiate a permanent, comprehensive, and just peace agreement. Uh, you know, when I said it's time to rethink and start fresh, this applies to everybody, including the Israelis and the Arabs. I mean, I believe now there should be, uh, the Arabs should immediately relaunch the Arab peace plan of 2002 and clarify it and say, here's what we're talking about. And the Israelis similarly should wake up and understand that they need to respond to this peace plan and negotiate about it and not just to keep uh, avoiding it. So I think more likely is a renewed political negotiation um, because resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict remains the single most important way to reduce uh, radicalization and extremism and, and uh, political tensions across the region. There's other causes of that, but it has been the biggest and longest source of uh, uh, radicalization and destabilization. Yes, please. Yes, hi. Uh, you mentioned the first Can you Arab identify oh, I'm yourself? sorry. My name is Omer Karasapan. I'm from the World Bank, but obviously not speaking on behalf of the World Bank. Uh, I'd have to speak yeah. for hours if I were to do that. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people wouldn't believe you either. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, you I spoke about the, uh, about the first Arab revolt, and a whole Arab system of states came out of that. Now that the Arabs are rewriting their own narrative, how do you see the Arab system of states evolving? Not tomorrow, but let's say in the next 10, 20 years. You know, I came here to watch college basketball games, and now I'm asked to predict the Arab future. It's a big leap. But I, I don't think it's easy to predict what's going to happen. I think we can say pretty confidently that what you see is what you get. In other words, the state system as it is will probably continue, even though in the transition of post-Soviet empire, the countries changed shape, and some countries were created and some were split up. And, uh, so I think we'll probably have Kuwait and Bahrain and Jordan and Syria the, as they are, but the relationships among them, between them, will change. Um, you'll have a much more rational European style, I think, integration at the social, and economic, and environmental level. And, but more importantly, you will have state policies that reflect popular sentiments. Um, and this, by nature, I think, is going to give birth to a, a revived form of Arab nationalist sentiment, pan-Arab sentiment at a certain level. Uh, Islamism will, uh, Islamic values, like in Turkey, is happening now. Uh, I think you, w Turkey is an extraordinary example of sort of Islamist secularism, a secular system which is infused with Islamic values, and it's a beautiful um, and I think the, the Arab world will hopefully go through something like that. But I think the relationships among states and the p exercise of power within states will radically change, I believe. And it has implications for Iran, for Turkey, uh, and for Israel, the three m big non-Arab powers in, uh, in the region. Judy, uh, just, uh, she's, just microphone, please. Judith Kipper. Thank you, Rami. Uh, it, the uh, monarchies have traditionally been more benign than the dictators, uh, but they're in trouble too. I'd like you to comment about the three monarchies uh, that are in poor countries, not the Saudis and uh, Emirates and Kuwait, but Bahrain, which is, uh, has, is a special problem because the majority of its population is Shiites and they're not handling it very well, Jordan and, uh, and Morocco where uh, can these monarchies survive? Is it time for them to move toward constitutional uh, monarchies? Will the people tolerate this kind of a, uh, of a system because the poverty is enormous? The, the, those three monarchies are under stress. There's no doubt about it. I think they probably can survive, but not in the shape that, uh, not in the configuration that they have for the last, uh, since their independence. I think there has to be a reconfiguration of the role of the monarch um, as a kind of um, 
you know, father figure and overseeing a broad national values, but leaving the business of governance to a more uh, popularly elected and accountable uh, mechanism, whether it's a national parliament or tribal councils. I mean, you know, the, the systems that the Arabs will create uh, will be very different. I mean, the Yemen system has to be based on massive tribal issues. Same in Jordan. In Jordan, you have the Palestinian, Jordanian uh, sensitivities. You, the political system has to reflect those realities. Kuwait, Morocco, they're all very different. So I think the, the mechanisms of governance uh, will evolve in a way that hopefully satisfies citizen demands and rights. I believe the monarchies can stay in place if they give themselves that role which responds to the single biggest demand that we've heard from the Arab people in the last two and a half, three generations, which is the demand for justice. Justice is the absolute number one issue that people want. And justice is a, is a vague, broad thing, but it's like love. You know when you, it happens to you, and you know when it's denied to you. And uh, so justice is, if the monarchs can play that role of being the arbiters, of being the guarantors of a mechanism that allows mechanisms of justice to work, I think it'll happen. The two key words to keep in mind, I believe, as we go forward, that define what's going on, are humiliation and legitimacy. Humiliation is what brought us to this point. Legitimacy is what will get us out of this mess. Legitimate institutions, legitimate exercise of power, legitimate concepts of statehood and citizenship. I believe it's, it's doable. Remember, places like Egypt have approximately five and a half thousand years of experience in doing this stuff, you know, urban, politics, national governance, um, uh, regional uh, relations. They know how to do this. They have m thousands and thousands of years of experience. Uh, they don't need people in Washington or London or Tel Aviv, uh, however well-meaning or, or they may be, to come and tell them how to do justice and how to do representation and how to do accountability. They know how to do it. These concepts emerged from the ancient uh, Middle East. So they just have to be given a chance. Uh, and therefore, I think they will do that. And the monarchs can stay if they really uh, transform into agents of justice and equity. It's not easy. And some of them may not be there. They might, uh, they might uh, be, uh, be, wa be washed aside. They're all uh, under stress now. And they should have done this years ago. But they didn't. And this is, you know, you get it. Sometimes you get a second chance in life. And I think a lot of people are now being given a second chance, including political leaders in this country, in Israel, in Europe, uh, everywhere, in the Arab world. Everybody's been given a second chance, and so let's get it right this time. Okay, I'm going to take um, two uh, questions, and that would be our last two questions. Yes, please, and then, in the, yes, uh, then you. We take two questions together. Ron. Yes, my name is Saeed Erika from Al Quds Daily Newspaper. Do you agree uh, with the perception among Arab? Uh, do you agree with the perception among uh, Arab intellectuals that the Egyptian Revolution has ushered in, in a way, a post-Islamist energy in the pursuit of democracy and freedom, and so on? Has ushered in what? Has ushered in a new post-Islamist post energy quest. Uh, I, I wouldn't phrase it like that. I, I would say the, the, any transformation going forward in Arab governance and democratization has to have a major Islamist component, as well as Arabist and tribalist and cosmopolitan, as I mentioned, and the state identity. You can't create a governance system that doesn't include a strong Islamist element, but that doesn't mean that it's an Iranian style or, or, a, or a Taliban style or even a Saudi style government system. It means like maybe Turkey has been able to do it well and, and, and other people around the world have been able to combine religious values with the concepts of citizenship, democracy and accountability. So I don't think, I don't think we can say post-Islamist because we've never had an Islamist phase of, uh, of governance or democracy or the Islamists emerged as the major resistance or opposition movements because they were the only ones who the government couldn't forbid. I mean, why did the churches emerge as the leaders of the civil rights movement? 
because you know the George Wallace and the and the racists in the South uh, and other could forbid any kind of civil rights for blacks and any kind of political activism, but they couldn't close the churches. And and the same in the Arab world. I mean, the religious organizations play this role, but the vast majority of Arabs don't want to live in theocratic countries, but they do want to have Islamic and 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 for Christians Christian values defining the way that exercise, power is exercised and the way that, uh, that they relate to each other. Uh, yes, last question, please. I have a, been, uh, I've enjoyed very much your talk. And it has it is made me think about something like, physician, heal thyself. Um, the United States is a democracy. I don't think anybody in their right mind would run for president of the United States, nor has anybody in the right mind run for president in the, during the past, you know, 30 or 40 years. Have you any suggestions about how to have a better government than the United States has? <laughs> Not really. No, I mean, the, you know, the United States, what I would say is that the American values that America stands for are fine values that people all over the world admire and they emulate and they'd like to experience those values. I think what the United States has to do is practice its values in its foreign policy. And the problem we've had is this, this tremendous divergence between American values and American foreign policy. So, and that's why I said the, you know, the Islamists, for instance, if there's Muslim brothers now in the government of Egypt or Hezbollah is, is involved in the government of Lebanon, the United States and Israel and Europeans shouldn't make the stupid, stupid mistake that they made before when they refused to talk to Hamas after it won an election. They should engage these people because they're democratically elected and they're legitimate in the eyes of their own people. Legitimacy in the eyes of your own people and adherence to international norms of decency and ethics and law are the two criteria that people should use. If, if you have groups that are uh, like that, you, you deal with them. The American way is to deal in democratic uh, societies and give everybody a chance and hold them accountable to the rule of law. So what we want is the U.S. to practice, to put its policies where its mouth is, to practice what it preaches around the world. And this is the biggest complaint that people have of the Europeans and the Americans and uh, another. So I'm, it's not for me to comment on, I'm happy to talk about uh, Big East basketball, but I, I don't think I would talk about American uh, government system. That's for people in this country to, uh, uh, to address. And, 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 you know, you have problems in this country, but I can tell you most people around the world envy what the United States has. Uh, and, and I think w what we want to see now is an Arab brand of democracy that is truly created by its own people that learns from your experiences uh, and others. So for, unlike you, our democracy at its birth will give women the vote and, and will not deny black people the right uh, to vote. Uh, we, hopefully we learn from people's experiences. We won't do genocidal attacks against uh, indigenous uh, people uh, and we won't do massive international slave trade. You did that but you don't do it anymore. So you, you, know, you learned and you improved and hopefully we will learn as, uh, from this and, and start um, with this cumulative wisdom that, uh, that we all have as, as human beings of one God. Uh, thank you, Rami. Please join me in thanking Rami for that.